everyone. My name is Haley, and if we haven't met, I am a full-time freelance writer and content marketer who lives north of Atlanta, Georgia. I am also a YA author and a musician, and I have a cat named Wendy whom I love, and I also happen to have a feeding tube. My feeding tube is not the only thing about me. It is not the most important thing about me, but it is a big part of my life. I wouldn't be here without it. And because of that, I'm passionate about educating people who maybe aren't familiar with how feeding tubes work or why a person might need a feeding tube, or maybe your doctors have said you might need a feeding tube, you're looking for information. That is why I'm here. So if you would like to know more about my story or about feeding tubes in general, keep watching and we are going to to get right into it. So I have several chronic illnesses, all caused by a genetic condition that affect almost every system in my body and significantly affect my everyday life. Today though, we're just going to be focusing on my feeding tube journey and my upper GI issues that started in April 2019. So that month, I was out to lunch with my dad one day. I had ordered tacos, but when I took my first bite, they tasted like cardboard. I started feeling really nauseous. I was full a few bites later. And so I took the tacos home, but I never finished them because these GI symptoms just kept increasing and kept getting worse until two weeks later, I was in the ER in such excruciating abdominal pain that we thought I had appendicitis. So fast forward six months later and I had lost 40 pounds. I was very sick, experiencing severe pain, nausea, bloating, appetite loss, getting full very quickly and lots of other symptoms. So in the last three years alone, I have had GI testing, including an endoscopy, a colonoscopy, CT scans, anorectal manometry, SITS marker study, barium swallow, two gastric emptying studies, which involve eating radioactive scrambled eggs. And let me tell you, if I never eat a plate of radioactive scrambled eggs again, it will be too soon. So lots of GI testing, and there have been many ER visits, countless GI doctors, dietitians, and during this whole time, my other chronic illnesses, such as POTS and seizures and migraines, were getting so much worse than they had been because I was constantly malnourished and dehydrated. I tried countless medications and diets and treatments for these new GI issues. I needed saline IV infusions all the time. I needed iron infusions. I had to buy a cane to help me walk because of weakness and other issues. The medical bills have kept piling up and because of my weight loss and malnourishment, I even developed new chronic illnesses like reactive hypoglycemia that I still deal with now. I have my continuous glucose monitor here. So I was essentially just in survival mode for years. I was living on 500 calories a day. My body could not function. And later I had friends tell me they thought I was dying. So the first time a feeding tube was mentioned to me was on my 21st birthday in February 2020. Ironically, my birthday happened during feeding tube awareness week each year. And I was home alone that day with a fever of 103. I could not eat. I was so weak I could barely lift my head. I talked to my dietitian on the phone that day and that was the first time that she suggested a tube. At that time, my lab work was fairly stable and my major weight loss that I had had the year before had kind of leveled off. And so my GI doctor at the time wasn't on board with the plan. He didn't think that a tube was necessary. It wasn't until a year and a half later when I had finally gotten into a new motility specialist at Emory 
and done a lot more testing with him that I got my tube. So during that time, I was getting sicker and sicker, and I finally received an official diagnosis for these new GI issues of gastroparesis, which is a condition where your stomach is partially paralyzed. I remember having a dream in May 2021 that I was getting my feeding tube changed. This was before I had a tube. I had a few dreams about feeding tubes before I got one. And I used to dream a lot that I was having my colon removed. And I woke up from that one dream just thinking, it's time. My body was very ready. This had been a long time coming. I felt like it was the right choice. My whole medical team was in agreement. So in June 2021, I had my tube placed. There are several different types of feeding tubes. I personally have a Peg J tube, so that's what this video will focus on since that is the only kind I have personal experience with. A lot of people will have a temporary nasal tube before they get their surgical tube just to make sure they tolerate tube feeds before you place something more permanent. My doctor decided to skip that step since testing had shown that my small intestine was fine. It's just my stomach and colon that have the issues. So I was more than happy to just go ahead with the surgical one and not have to deal with, with the nose hose. But if you're curious about those types of tubes, there's plenty of information online that you can find. Um, so Peg J tube. This type of tube has a G port this goes into my stomach I don't really use that port for anything and then it also has a J port that goes into my small intestine so this is what I feed through and this allows me to just bypass my stomach completely since my stomach is partially paralyzed and that's where the terrible symptoms come from when I eat and then the PE part of peg J just means that this kind of tube is placed via endoscopy. Um, so when I had my feeding tube placed, I was in the hospital for a couple of nights and then I stayed at my parents' house for a couple of nights before coming home. I was definitely in a lot of pain at first, moving, breathing, talking, and at first I was on Kate Farms standard formula and I actually got a lot sicker for about a month or maybe even six weeks after getting my tube because I did not tolerate that formula well at all. I was getting even less calories than before and so I was finally able to switch to Kate Farms Peptide 1.5 which this is a formula that's more broken down, it's easier to absorb, and it has been so much better for me. I love Kate Farms. So I use a Kangaroo Joey pump to run my feeds. So I use dual bag sets. So I have two bags, one for feed, one for flush. So in the feed bag, I pour my cartons of formula. In the flush bag, I pour Pedialyte, and then I hook the bags up to the pump. And then next I put both the bag set and the pump into this special backpack that I can carry around with me everywhere I go. I have an IV pole but I don't really use it because there's just no point when the backpack is so portable. And I run my formula at 40 milliliters an hour because that is the highest rate I can tolerate. And then once an hour, I flush with 80 milliliters of Pedialyte. So this gives me my hydration and a boost of electrolytes, as well as just making sure that the, um, the line doesn't get clogged. I am typically on my pump for about 22 to 23 hours a day to get enough calories and I sometimes will unhook my pump if I'm leaving the house for just a few hours and I don't want to deal with it but I just have to be careful doing this because I have very bad blood sugar lows when I'm not running feeds. Taking care of my feeding tube is pretty easy. I wash the tube site in the shower with just soap and water. It does not have to be sterile. I can just clean it the same way I clean the rest of my body. I will flush the line manually with a syringe so it doesn't get clogged. If it does get clogged, I will use warm water or Coke and just keep um, pulling back and pressing down with the syringe until it hopefully comes unclogged. That never happens at a convenient time. And I also change out my tubey pads as often as needed, sometimes every couple of hours if I'm having a lot of 
um, drainage or granulation tissue, these little pads go under the bumper of my tube right up next to the skin and they are there to soak up any stomach acid or blood that comes out of the stoma and this prevents my skin from getting irritated and hopefully prevents my shirts from getting stained. Tubey pads are so cute. I would say they are honestly the best part of having a tube. I get them on Etsy and they are so much fun. So a lot of people wonder if you can still eat if you have a feeding tube. Having a feeding tube does not affect your ability to eat. However, the reason that myself and most other people who have a tube got their tube is because we couldn't eat to begin with. Before I got my tube, the foods that I could tolerate were very limited. The recommended diet for gastroparesis, it's sort of essentially just the brat diet, like bananas, rice, applesauce, toast, just very like plain, safe foods. I could not eat dairy, fruits and vegetables, red meat, anything high fat, high fiber, no nuts and seeds. And I could only eat very small amounts of food per meal, per day, because gastroparesis makes you feel full very quickly since the food stays in your stomach for too long. But basically, it didn't matter what I ate. It was sort of just the act of eating that made me feel really sick or caused me to be in severe pain. After I got my tube, I was encouraged to continue eating by mouth as I felt like it. And so for the first several months, I would often have just small safe meals like maybe chicken and rice or toast and scrambled eggs. But unfortunately, over time, my symptoms continued worsening. And at this point, it has been about three months since I've been able to eat by mouth. I will sometimes eat something if I have a really bad blood sugar low, in which case I sometimes can't stop myself. Or I might have some graham crackers if it's a day where I just want to eat something so badly. But for the most part, I'm only able to do clear liquids now by mouth and sometimes not even that. Not being able to eat is a whole separate topic, honestly, and one that's really difficult to deal with. I try not to think about food anymore because that is just easier, and I'm not going to get into all the emotions of it here, but it can be incredibly hard not being able to eat anything and to have to sort of reframe your entire life without eating, no grocery shopping, no cooking, no doing dishes. I miss doing dishes, and Besides the fact that I just miss eating food and tasting food, this is also just a reminder that this is something that makes me different and my body does not function like most people's and I cannot participate in this normal part of life, which can be hard. One other thing I wanted to touch on, I also just want to make it clear that my feeding tube did not heal me or cure me. I am still sick. My feeding tube does not change that. What my feeding tube does do, however, is provide a source of consistent and steady nutrition and hydration that my body can't get any other way. So even though my body is still sick and probably always will be, my body is stable. For two years, I felt like I was watching my body deteriorate in front of me and going through such a steep decline, especially at the age of 20 was terrifying, but now that I have my tube, I know that my body is stable. I gained back all 40 pounds that I lost. It is such an enormous relief to not have to worry about force feeding myself through awful GI symptoms. Some of my symptoms of my other illnesses have improved and my cognitive function has seen the most drastic improvement. It is now so much easier, now that I'm getting enough calories, it's so much easier to work, to think, to hold a conversation. I've even been able to start writing novels again for the first time in years. Friends told me that the first few months after I got my tube were like watching me come back to life, and that's how I felt too. Life with a feeding tube is definitely still not easy, Sometimes there is blood pouring out of my stoma in the shower, just casually. Sometimes, too often, I am up at 2 a.m. doing laundry because my, my formula leaked everywhere. Sometimes I have to have my tube replaced twice in one week. True story. And tube replacements are an 
all day under anesthesia at the hospital type of thing. There is bloody granulation tissue, heavy boxes of formula, more ER visits, and sometimes really this underlying feeling of anxiety because I am 100% dependent pretty much on my tube for the nutrition and hydration that my body needs. Life with a feeding tube is not easy, but life without a feeding tube was so much harder. I have never felt at all sorry for myself because I have a feeding tube. I am extremely grateful for my tube every day. I think it was the best treatment decision we could have made. My feeding tube gave me myself back, and for that, I will always be more grateful than words can say. If you have any questions about my story or about feeding tubes in general, feel free to ask them in the comments or connect with me on my Instagram, my blog. Those will both be linked below in the description. And if you have a feeding tube, I would love to connect with you as well. Thank you so much for watching and for celebrating Feeding Tube Awareness Week with me.